Thank you for tuning in today to listen to another one of the presentations on unsung heroes of World War II. I'm Frank Stritter, and today we're going to have a, an interesting uh, presentation for you about the Navajo Code Talkers. I want to begin with a, a true false question for you. Native American code talkers were first used by the U.S. military in World War II, true or false? You got your answer? You were right if you said false. Yes, Native American code talkers, particularly those from the Navajo tribe, were first used on an organized basis in World War II. The U.S. Army, however, had successfully experienced and experimented with them, with the code talkers in World War I, using soldiers from both the Choctaw and Cherokee tribes, as you can see here in the, uh, in the photograph. So let's talk about the Navajo code talkers of World War II. Now, the 16 million men and women who served in the U.S. Armed Forces during World War II included over 24,000 Native Americans from the several reservations and another 20,000 off-reservation Native Americans, totaling 10% of the Native American population. When many of them returned home after the war, they found that even though they had put their lives on the line for their country, States from which they came did not consider them citizens of the United States, meaning they could not vote. Uh, to summarize the status of Native Americans at that time, in 1924, Congress passed and President Coolidge signed the Native American Citizenship Act, which theoretically gave all Native Americans citizenship and the right to vote. But Coolidge and his Congress did not enact that law out of their own benevolence. They saw this as their way to break up Native nations and forcefully assimilate them into American society. However, the right to vote was still governed by state law. Seven states, therefore, had refused to grant Native Americans the voting rights as recently as 1938. Those states justified their discrimination based on their restrictive state constitutions and statutes. In, in the Nationality Act of 1940, Congress once again conferred citizenship on Native Americans, primarily so that it could require Native American men to register for the draft and thereby serve in the military. Native Americans wondered why the federal government had the power to force them to serve in the military, but did not have the power to compel states to grant them the vote. Some of them did volunteer for the military, while others resisted and waited to be drafted. The right of all Native Americans to vote in U.S. elections was not fully recognized until 1948, when landmark Supreme Court cases were passed recognizing the right of Native Americans to vote in Arizona and New Mexico. Native Americans were still not permitted to vote in every state until 1962, when Utah became the last state to guarantee voting rights for Native Americans. Some states still found a way to prevent many Native Americans from voting with poll taxes, literacy tests, and intimidation the same tactics used against African-American voters. In 1942, Philip Johnston, a World War I Marine Corps veteran, made an interesting proposal. A civil engineer from Los Angeles, he was a child of missionaries who had raised him on the Navajo reservation. So he had grown up speaking Navajo. Johnson learned that Japanese intelligence specialists had managed to intercept many US military messages. He had an idea to base a secret code 
on the Navajo language. Johnson met with communications officers from the Marine Corps and described how a code based on Navajo could thwart enemy code breakers. The Marine Corps thought it worth a try and proceeded with a program that led to the formation of the Navajo Code Talkers. Code Talkers were mostly Navajos, but some from other tribes as well, who were, who were recruited to serve in the Marine Corps. The Navajo language became the basis for a code that was virtually unbreakable by the Japanese. This was in part due to its syntax and tonal variations, but also because it was an oral language that did not exist in written form. Code talkers can then use their native language to orally transmit secret tactical messages. Now, let's focus a, for a bit on Chester Nez, one of the original code talkers. He was born in Chichilta, New Mexico, which means among the oak trees in Navajo. His mother died when he was only three, so he spent his childhood days herding sheep for his grandmother before leaving his close-knit community to a boarding school in Tuba City, Arizona, run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. A missionary driving him to his new school gave him the English name of Chester, after U.S. President Chester A. Arthur. Why not George or Abe? Why Chester? He was also given his father's last name of Nez. That, that means very tall in Navajo. Interestingly, Navajo tradition uses the mother's clan name, but he was not allowed to use it. His Navajo given name was lost over time. Chester remembered some students at school being beaten for using their native language but he was only punished by having his mouth washed out with soap for using English. Correction for not using English. Chester and the other students were taught at school to be Christians, specifically Catholics. They were taught the white man's way at school and the Navajo way at home. Each culture saw the other as wrong, which had the potential of leaving the young students utterly confused. In early 1942, the Marine Corps obtained permission of the Navajo Tribal Council to recruit young Navajos from Chester School for a secret project the Corps was initiating to develop a new secret code. Aha. In April of that year, Nez was recruited out of the 10th grade for the project along with 200 other young Navajos. After a rigorous selection process, Nez and 28 others were signed to Platoon 382 at Marine Corps Base San Diego for basic training before they could begin their project. After basic training, the 29 then became code talkers by spending 13 weeks creating and memorizing the code in which they would use to relay important tactical messages in combat. They came up with a coded alphabet and code words in Navajo that represented various military terms.
After developing their code, Nez and his comrades were assigned to the 1st Marine Division. It landed on the beach at Guadalcanal in the South Pacific in November 1942. The first message that Nez translated said, Japanese machine gun on your right flank, destroy. Initially, he and his team relayed messages using a cumbersome TBX radio that had to be cranked by hand to generate power. But they later switched to battery operated handheld walkie talkies like the one shown in this photograph. Nez and his fellow code talkers tried to stick together in combat as being with each other helped to put them more or less at ease. Due to their physical appearance, several code talkers went through the frightening experience of being mistaken for Japanese soldiers by their fellow Marines. This happened to Nez and a friend one night. The two were held at gunpoint until an officer from the communications center arrived to identify them. On the eve of the first Marine Division's invasion of Okinawa, expected to be the bloodiest landing yet, several Navajos performed a sacred dance invoking their deity's blessings and protection for themselves and their Ameri other American comrades. They prayed that their enemies would be weak. Some white Marines scoffed from the sidelines, but when war correspondent Ernie Pyle reported the story, he observed that the Okinawa landings had gone a lot easier than had been anticipated. A point, he said, the Navajo Marines were quick to point out to the skeptics. When Japanese resistance inland almost halted the American advance, a white Marine asked his Navajo foxhole mate what he thought of his prayers now. The Navajo responded, that is completely different. We only prayed for help during the landings. Nez said he worried every day that he might make an error that would cost the life of a fellow Marine. He said, when bombs drop, generally we code talkers couldn't just curl up in a shelter. We almost always needed to transmit information, to ask for supplies and ammunition, and to communicate strategies. After each transmission, we had to move to avoid being discovered by the Japanese. Once the Marines realized what a high security risk the code talkers were, they began to assign bodyguards to them. The code talkers were not told who their bodyguards were or even if they had officially been assigned one. The code talkers just realized that suddenly they had very good buddies. We even went to the, to the latrine with them. It was even rumored that the bodyguards had orders to kill their code talkers rather than allow them to be captured. Nez reported that he did not know if that was true, but that he would much rather have been killed by an American bullet than by Japanese torture. Nez also reported that no code talker was ever executed by his bodyguard. Nez spent four years in the South Pacific seeing combat on the islands of Guadalcanal, Bougainville, Guam, Peleliu, and Angwar. Upon him returning home, he was hospitalized for five months with fatigue, stress, and nightmares that we now call PTSD. A total of 420 Navajos served as code talkers with 16 of them being killed in combat. The code talkers serving with all six Marine divisions in the South Pacific, they received lavish praise for their work during the major Marine assaults. Major Howard Connor, the signal officer of the 5th Marine Division, had six Navajo code talkers working around the clock during the battle on Iwo Jima. He said the entire operation was directed by Navajo code talkers. During the two days that followed the initial landings, I had six Navajo radio nets working around the clock. They sent and received over 800 messages without an error. Were it not for the Navajo code talkers, we never would have taken Iwo Jima. The Navajo code baffled the, Jap <clears throat> the Japanese who had previously deciphered all codes used by the US Army. After the war, the Japanese chief of intelligence admitted 
they were never able to crack the Navajo code used by the code talkers. Despite the horrors of war, Ned was proud to have been in service with the Marines and proud that his language helped win the war in the Pacific. Ned wrote in his autobiography, when I arrived home after the war, I told myself that my father will be very happy to learn how the Navajo language helped the troops. My family will be proud of my part in developing the top secret code. I just had to make it through the war so I could see Chichilta again. He was discharged in 1945 as a PFC, private first class, but was not allowed to discuss his wartime responsibilities until 1968. After his discharge, Nez wore his Marine dress uniform to the federal building in Gallup, New Mexico to register for his identity card that all Native Americans were required to carry at that time. A white clerk said to him, you know that you are not a citizen of the United States. You can't even vote. Nez held his temper and quickly walked out before he said or did something he would later regret. New Mexico finally granted the vote to Native Americans in 1948. The return to civilian life did not go smoothly for many of the code talkers. They expected the same respect back home that they had had received as Marines, but many were not able to find jobs. That often led to alcohol, then lost opportunity, and then disappearing self-respect. Many code talkers died of diseases, both mental and physical, brought about by alcoholism, often penniless, but they kept the secrets of the code talkers. During the Korean conflict, the Marine Corps recalled Nez to active duty. He had not anticipated being sent back to war, but he was ready to go when recalled, saying that, I felt it was a job to be done, so I just went back in. This time he was not sent to the combat zone, but served two years in both Hawaii and Idaho before he was discharged as a corporal. After returning to civilian life, he studied art at Kansas University, but had to withdraw in 1952 when his GI Bill funding expired. He was then married, had a family, and had a career as an artist painter at the VA hospital in Albuquerque. <clears throat> Kansas University finally awarded him a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree at the age of 91 during a, 19, during a 2012 ceremony. A memorial to Chester Nez and all the Navajo Code Talkers and a museum was erected in 1995 and stands today on the Navajo Reservation just off I-40 in Arizona. Because the Code Talkers' work remained a top military secret for years, or because they were just discriminated against, these Native American war heroes were not celebrated for their contributions until in year 2000, Senator Jeff Bingaman of New Mexico sponsored a law honoring the Navajo Code Talkers. Congress passed it and President Clinton signed it into law in December 2000. In 2001, President Bush awarded the Congressional Gold Medal to Nez, three others of the five living original code talkers and families of the other 24 diseased talkers. Why do we always wait until most of the awardees have died before we recognize them? In 2008, President Bush signed the Code Talkers Recognition Act this act recognized every other Native American code talker who served in either World War I or World War II, except for those Navajos who had already been awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. Now these other new Indian Native Americans were awarded a Congressional Gold Medal also. For the last 10 years of his life, Nez devoted his time to educating people about the work of code, the code talkers. He always signed his name, Corporal Chester Nez, and wore his code talker uniform at public appearances. His son, Mike, said, he wants young people to know what the code talkers did in World War II. 
He wants them to be proud to be Navajo. He wants them to know how they fought for their country. He also wants them to learn their own language. In the face of discrimination that he had experienced, Nez could nevertheless eloquently state, I am glad that my country in a time when Native Americans could not vote in Arizona and New Mexico, gave us Navajo men a chance to prove our dedication to saving our land and our people. We are citizens of the US and we love our country just as other citizens do. It's important that my people take pride in their heritage, especially the young people. I hope that learning about the code talkers will help them to do that. It's also important that the non-Navajos learn how a culture so different from theirs contributed to the U.S. victory in World War II. <clears throat> Nez co-authored an autobiography with Judith, Judith Avila about his wartime experiences that was published in 2011. It's a very good read. Chester Nez died in 2014 at the age of 93 and was buried in the Santa Fe National Cemetery. He wrote in his book, I'm no hero. I just wanted to serve my country. Corporal Nez, thank you and your fellow code talkers for that service. And thank you for taking the time to learn about the code talkers and Corporal Nez here today. We hope you'll tune in again the next time we talk about another group of unsung heroes of World War II.